Hey, what's going on everyone? Welcome back to Backtrack Cinema. In this movie review today, we'll be looking at 2003's Master and Commander. So pop some popcorn, get a drink, get comfy, and let's talk Master and Commander. Master and Commander was released in 2003, directed by Peter Weir and starring Russell Crowe and Paul Bettany. Hey everyone, my name is Jason. Welcome to Backtrack Cinema. This is a channel where we talk movies of the past that you know and love. And today we're going back to 2003 to review one of my absolute favorite films of all time, Master and Commander. Before we get going, let me know in the comments below what you think of this movie. Do you think this is an underrated gem like I do or have you even seen it? And if you haven't seen it, I really suggest you go see this. But let me know in the comments below. Let's have a great discussion about Master and Commander, and what is your favorite Russell Crowe film? Let me know in the comments with that too. So yeah, guys, I watched this film so many times. At one time, when I first watched this, and you know, I kept watching it, watching it, watching it, this was actually my favorite film of all time. I know it was even over Rocky at, at one time, at one time. it I love this movie. It shifts a lot. Some You catch me on the right day, this is my favorite film of all time. I absolutely love this film. It's like Peter Weir just went, Jason, I'm going to make a movie for you. This is your movie. The reason behind that, guys, is I love historic period pieces. I love Russell Crowe. I love reading upon naval warships and the strategies and what life was like. I even got a thick book called The Royal Navy of back in those times. And, you know, oceans were battlefields, like the movie says. And nothing, this movie depicts that life to a T. Their characters are made up. They're all based on Patrick O'Brien's series of book called Master and Commander. There's 20 books. I think they grab like um, ideas from 13 different books and put them all in a mess in this one movie, but nothing really feels forced about it. This is an absolutely fantastic movie. It feels like a really big warm blanket over me. When I watch this, I have to get a nice hot cup of tea, get under my blanket, sit in my living room and just put this on and just relish in this. You know, it's just a fan. And that has to do with how kind of like cold the movie feels and how authentic everything really is. During the Napoleonic Wars, a brash British captain pushes his ship and crew to their limits in pursuit of a formidable French war vessel around South America. So, yeah, guys, this movie does this really great, realistic approach of what life was like on the naval warship in these times. And in fact, the, the, the actual book uh, happened years later. In the book, they were chasing an American frigate. But if you're selling a movie to Hollywood, making um, chasing, uh, making an America the villains, probably not the wisest choice. So they changed it to a French um, war vessel that, they, that they're chasing. You know, Captain Jack Aubrey, played by Russell Crowe, has got these orders to chase her, take her as a prize. And it's so it's really simplistic in its storytelling, but it's all the subplots, the characters, the character moments, the performances that really carry this movie through, give it its heart, the music going on, and the lack of music. Where he puts that music. I mean, Peter Weir is not talked about enough. This guy is brilliant brilliant man the attention the detail on this thing the dialogue the way they're talking um it's not they don't go for this hollywood approach they wanted to make a hollywood movie get people in the seat give you a, a real life experience and they did that this movie won like four oscars got nominated for 10 it went up against uh return to the king so it lost a, like if there was no return to the king this movie would have cleaned up Cleaned up. It's a masterpiece, man. It's a filmmaker's film. 18 pounds. Okay, We're gonna have to get closer to Pokey's eye. Run out the starboard battery. Aye, sir. Mr. Allen, come up on the wind. On the wind, sir. Blame me alongside a pistol shot. Stand tall on the quarter deck, son, all of us. Mr. Boyle, run up the colors. Aye, sir. And just the attention to the detail, like I said, with the dialogue, they're they're talking as if they were back in those times. They're not simplifying things for us to understand it. Not holding her hand. I love directors who don't hold your hand through a fucking movie. He assumes that you could read up on things to understand what's going on. I just studied and read up a lot about Royal uh, Navy and all the, the terms they use. And I was I read a lot of books about this stuff and novels. So I just knew what they were talking about. But someone who didn't know any of that stuff, you really have to pay attention to what's really going on. 
But I love that. I love how it's really grounded and feels real. And everything with the ships and the prop department, there is very little CGI, if any, in this. They built these ships. Everything was really practical. The way they run the ship, everyone's duty, everyone's job, um, the, the discipline on the ship, everything is just so detailed. And they did their homework. They absolutely did their homework to give us a real life experience. And the movie really is feels like an experience And the way the cinematography is done by Russell Boyd. Absolutely stunning. The atmosphere that's created that opening scene. This is one of the best opening scenes of all time in a movie. Right away, we see this British warship, uh, Her Majesty's Ship Surprise. It's called Captain by Jack Aubrey get completely decimated because the French frigate comes out of the fog and it's got the weather gauge and, and attacks the ship and they just get decimated. And I just love this scene with, with the, the fog and everything. And you know, the lack of music, you could have had music going through here, but they keep it silent. Let you hear all the, the ambient noise that you would hear on the ocean. Right. And I think that's just fantastic. And the battle sequence here is it's just, it's riveting. It's amazing. It has tension. You see all these little details that happen through it. Freaking just love this movie. I mean, like I would have loved to see the storyboards for this thing to see how this thing was shot and everything. The, because it's like a painting. It's a work of art, man. A work of art. Every shot was just, you could see they put so much detail into it. The shots of the ship sailing through the storm. Jack Aubrey on, on the mast. You know, when the ship's coming in and they're attacking and they're both attacking each other. It's just, it's just out of a painting. They're out of the, like these ship paintings. The storyboards was, must have been an incredible and such a daunting task. This movie must have been such a daunting task. It's unfortunate we never got a sequel because, you know, this was a 200 plus budget in 2003 and only made like, wasn't like 92 million um, worldwide. I think it made a lot more. So it, it barely made its money back from its marketing and everything like that, you know, uh, going up against Return of the King was probably, you know, a, a, a difficult task. But uh, this is the greatest movie of the 21st century for me. And like like the modern movies ever since 2000, this is the greatest film ever made from, from that year on. Really at the heart, though, these themes of duty, friendship, loyalty, leadership. We got a beautiful performance by Russell Crowe in here. Captain Jack Aubrey, he's always outmanned. He's always outgunned in this. And as far as the main storyline, the chase scene, it's pretty fantastic the way Captain Jack Aubrey and the French captain keep trying to outwit each other. You know what I mean? The, the first two times this French frigate sneaks up on Jack, and I just love that moment where he's like, this is the second time this man has done to me. There will not be a third. And, and it's fantastic because he escapes into the fog. He creates this decoy like this miniature ship and he sends one of his midshipmen on it as a decoy so the french guys attacking that and they tack around him come up behind him and start chasing him but then they run into a storm and then he loses a crew member he loses his mast he's got to you know he's got he's got to make tough decisions it's when one of his crew members falls over with the mast the mast is pulling the ship down and he's got to cut the kid loose and pretty much send him to his own death. So this tough decisions this captain has to make. And then he runs into where there's no wind. And it's just when there's no wind, you can't move your ship, right? So it has a bit of everything in this. And we got, it's really, and like I said, with the themes, with the duty and friendship, we got these two characters, Jack Opry, the captain, the surgeon, Stephen, played by Paul Bettany. And, and they're just two really good friends, but... One is all about duty and king and country. The, the other is kind of a naturalist. He's a surgeon. He's about progressing things, progressing mankind kind of thing. So we're put in his position because if we don't know nothing about naval warfare or ships or, you know, how the, how the weather gauge works, how ship battle works, neither does he. So they do a great job in this script by explaining everything by making him ask questions and then we get these answers right but it's all about their friendship and how he thinks jack aubrey is pushing his crew too far and maybe they should have turned back because they're out man they're out gun they're they have to fix their ship on on a on an island somewhere and it, it it tests their friendship jack makes a promise to him where he's like you can go on the Galapagos Islands while we get food and water and study the animals and all that kind of stuff. Cause that's what he wants to do. And then he breaks that promise. Cause you know, subjects to the requirements of the service. 
But then later on in the movie, when, when Steven gets shot and Jack has to make a decision to chase this friendship because he has the weather gauge now, he can finally take it as a prize or save his friend. And he chooses his friendship. And I just think that's a great little arc for the captain. And then what happens is when he, when he, tra- when Steven takes a, a bunch of the midshipmen, he goes on this island, walks across the other side of the island. He spots the French ship they've been looking after. And they disguise themselves as whalers to uh, to spring this trap and to get her as a prize. Great battle sequence. It has the sword fighting and the cannon fire. Every life is just fantastic. Looks like the job is done, sir. I shall <laughs> And then there's three shipmen, uh, there's three midshipmen, and they're practically kids except for one of them's around 30, but the other two are kids, and that's really realistic. That's what I liked about this movie, that they had like 12-year-olds in charge. You know, they had, uh, they were midshipmen, right? We have these two friends, Lord Blakeney and Calamy, and they're two young midshipmen who are really good friends. One, you know, gets his freaking arm, has to get his arm cut off at the beginning of the movie, so... You know, he he can't do too much, but he becomes a fantastic leader and he ends up being kind of a naturalist by going with the doctor and learning about the study of animals and stuff like that. Then we got Calamy and all he wants to do is serve his country. He He wants to be in the fight. He wants the captain to give him a chance to serve his country. And so he gets to board the other ship, but he ends up getting killed. But it's actually, uh, he gets ends up getting killed. It's sad, but it's actually a good character arc for him because that's what he, all he wanted was to serve his country. And the big subplot here is with Hollem. Hollem is a midshipman who tries to be friends with the crew. He doesn't get much respect. And Captain Jack's trying to make Hollem into a leader by saying, you know, they're not your friends. They want discipline. They want you to lead. They want to see you lead, earn their respect. That kind of thing, right? This movie has a you can really um you can really relate to it if you have if you had any kind of leadership role. And I just love that line where Russell Crowe's like, you know, you're not here to be their friend, but nor do you have to be a tyrant. You don't make friends with the former Jacks lad. They'll despise you in the end, think you're weak. Nor do you need to be a tyrant. Great line. It really is a great line. Because none of the crew respects him. He's actually set up as this. They're blaming him, actually. Every time Holland was on deck, something bad happened. Whether they got into the storm, the French ship came out of nowhere and, you know, and, you know, and attacked them. So he ends up taking his own life and sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And then they get their wind back. That's when they actually get the wind back and able to, you know, plot a course, move along, go after this French ship. Another thing I really like about Captain Jack Aubrey too, is just the way he leads. You know, this is guy's not a tyrant. He's not all about, he's not hard, hard discipline. He's tough. He's fair, but they all respect them. He has fun when he's out there. It seems like even when he's chasing the French frigate, you know what I mean? He's, he's having, he's on the top of the ship and he's racing one of his, his, his lieutenant down. He's teaching his midshipmen how, how to plot a course and everything. And he's having so much fun. Mr. Blakeney, turn three times. Oh, Russell Crowe is charismatic. He's engaging. He's got this big heart. Such a great performance Russell Crowe did in this. He should have won the Oscar for this, man. This is my favorite Russell Crowe performance. Stephen, this hierarchy is even in nature, as you've often said yourself. There is no disdain in nature. There is no humiliation. Men must be governed. Often not wisely, I'll grant you, but they must be governed nonetheless. That's the excuse of every tyrant in history. Editing guys in this movie is also really, really good. Um, I don't know if it won, but it should have too, because there's very few movies I can say this about. Every single scene in this movie flows into the next one. Every single scene has a purpose. That's one of the contributing factors to a perfect film. When every scene has a purpose and is needed for the next one and the next one and flows into the next one, arcs are completed and, you know, you needed this for this, for us to understand this. It's all there. There's nothing just there just to give us entertainment or just to say, oh, you know, that's just a good moment. And no, it's all important. It's all relative. Fantastic. I can't say enough about this film, guys. This this, this film is absolutely fantastic. I'm going to give Master and Commander from 2003 an A+. Plus. Well, what about you guys? Let me know in the comments what you think of this movie. What you thought of the review? 
absolutely love this movie. Thank you for joining me on this review. And make sure you click over there for other related content. I send you down the rabbit hole. As I always say, enjoy the channel. Go down to past videos. All that jazz. My name is Jason. You are watching Backtrack Cinema. And I will see you in the movies. Cheers.